Okay, class, now we're in moving into module 18. We're gonna do something a little differently today. We're gonna to be covering about eight different vegetable crops. So we just wanted to kind of speed through this. So the three of us are here to do kind of a little round robin thing. So we're just gonna go straight into vegetables, everything else. So some of the uh, other plant vegetables, um, family vegetables that you might see are the Asperaceae, the Help me out with these, uh, Joe. <laughs> you're the uh, you're the Latin expert here. Come on. Oh, I got that. Amaryllidaceae, the Asparagaceae, the Convolvulaceae, the Poaceae, the Asparaceae, Pinnipodiaceae, Apiaceae, Malvaceae. You gotta say, shut the ACE up, right? <laughs> I mean, who says Latin is a dead language, huh? <laughs> so, as you can see, some of the less known stuff, right? So let's go straight into the Amaryllidaceae, I got that right. Okay, <laughs> so they, I guess everything used to be something else. Formerly, Aliaceae, so when all the experts get together and they decide they're gonna change the name, they've got their reasons, you know, the, they might be vague, but they've, they've got their reasons, and they will argue about it for years. But uh, we're gonna go with this, uh, Amaryllidaceae is the current family name. Some of the characteristics, are, they are perennial, so they are around, um, more than one year. Mm -hmm. They are monocots. They do produce bulbs, so uh, those are usually something that uh, that we can easily transport, and that's a, that's a nice thing to be able to uh, to propagate that plant with. Mm -hmm. um, the flowers they have parts that are in threes, so multiples of threes. So the petals are going to have three, six, or nine, so on. And they usually and usually the flowers are clustered in a ball, like uh, you see in the photos above me. And the fruit are dry capsules with black seeds, although that's usually not actually what we're eating. So we want to grow onions, um, are one of the main products that, in that family. So it includes um, it, onions, shallots, garlic, chives, and leeks. So they are a cool season crop. So they want, they're planted in the fall, the um, winter, and growing through early spring. They do like full sun. Most of our vegetables, again, like full sun. They are grown from seeds. They can be grown from transplants or bulbs. So leeks uh, are seeds or transplants. Onions, they are planted as seeds, plant, transplants, or bulbs. And chives, seeds or transplants. Shallots, seeds or bulbs. Um, germination, the optimum temperature between 68 and 78 degrees with a well-drained loam or sandy loam soil with a pH of 5.5 to 6.5. Uh, of course, you're, you know, we can't say this enough times, soil test is the best way to go to get your pH and your soil fertility recommendations. But if you um, don't have time for that step, the general recommendations are one pound of 8-24-24 fertilizer per 75 square feet of garden area at the planting and then side dress every four to six weeks with a high nitrogen fertilizer. So they want to boost at, right at planting and then come in later on to make sure they get that, that nutrient requirement. The spacing for uh, these, and again, this depends on the variety because sometimes the plants are, uh, the varieties are bigger than others. But in general, chives only need about four to six inches with about 75 to 85 days to harvest. Garlic, about four to six inches, 210 days to harvest. So it's a good long time to invest in a plant. Um, leeks, only six to eight inches, 110, 125 days. Onions, four to six inches, with only, only about 60 to 160 days to harvest. And again, that's very much varietal dependent. Uh, green scallions, um, 60 days, you can start cutting them, but they mature in about 100 to 160 days. And then finally, shallots, four to six inches apart with 105 to 110 days uh, before you harvest them. It's best to harvest these things, uh, chives. You uh, actually clip the leaves as soon as they reach about four inches or more. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those continually growing things. And it's nice, nice to have a little pot of chives outside of your door. You can go in there every time you need some. You just cut them. Um, and they will just re keep growing back from the uh, from the bulb. Garlic, 
is harvested in the summer when the bottom leaves begin to turn yellow, uh, begin to yellow and turn brown. So again, you're waiting for that uh, plant to mature. It's letting you know that uh, it's going to, those uh, leaves are going to turn brown and just disappear into the soil. So you want to make sure you pick, pick it before you lose track of where they are. Uh, leeks, you, uh, you harvest them when the plants reach the desired size and the leaves are still green. So leeks can get pretty big, but uh, uh, you want to pick them while the leaves are still green. Onions are picked as green, um, as green onions as soon as they reach the desired size. So you start cutting those uh, onion tops and using them in your cooking when they're as big as you'd like. Or when you, uh, if you want to wait till they're mature, when the neck becomes soft and the tops are falling over. So again, this is something that's happening. You know, what we're picking is underground and those above ground parts will disappear and go away as it matures. And then shallots in the summer when the tops, all, uh, when the tops fall over and begin to brown. So again, we're waiting for that mature plant. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about insect pests. I still call these the alley ones of old school. <laughs> and that's what they're listed as in a lot of seed catalogs and yeah. older books that you might encounter, especially if you have gardening books on your shelves. Um, so don't get too confused. You can still call them that, it's fine. Um, some common pests are the thrips. Now, onion thrips, western flower thrips, and um, some other ones, they'll actually get in and cause a silvering on the tops, on the leaves of these um, different alliums, or <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to keep saying it. Um, you can control them with natural enemies or spray some spinosad that works just fine. Um, there's actually leaf miners that can get into the tops of a lot of these plants as well. And that's those white winding trails, almost like curly cues. And we, we do see that on a lot of other crops like tomatoes, um, eggplant, peppers, citrus trees down here. Um, it's the same little critter, so you can control that. Usually no control is needed, but you can cut the worst infected or infested leaves off, bag them, and just discard them if they do bother you. Um, if you're growing green onions, that's the part you cook with, so you might want to do that if you have too much of a problem with them. So some of the common diseases we're going to have with the, um, the different Amaryllidaceae <laughs> or the alliums <laughs> that we're growing. Um, now some of these, like I said, you've probably seen before uh, on other crops, but I'm sure a lot of these you have seen at home. And you weren't quite sure what it was, so we're going to tell you what it is, and then you can forget it if you want. But you'll at least recognize <laughs> that it's a disease that, uh, and in some cases, you'll remember. Oh yeah, that's a fungal disease. I remember those guys telling me about, like the black mold. That one, as you'll see on the uh, upper right here, that one a lot of people have seen because that one's uh, most often a post-harvest type disease, and you'll see that that, that black fungus developing on the bulbs and. That one's pretty common, uh, a lot of people see it. Um, and the best way is to store your onions below 59 degrees. It won't stop the disease, but it will uh, slow it down and usually reduce the onions before uh, the disease develops. Uh, Botrytis leaf blight, that's another. Botrytis is a common uh, disease causing fungus. You have the, the lesions on the, the leaves, there's usually a green halo around, around those lesions. And with a lot of diseases, we're gonna say this to you a lot about diseases and even with insects. Sanitation, sanitation, avoid overhead watering, avoid overhead watering. If you do those two things in your garden and forget everything else, your garden's gonna be a lot healthier and a lot less disease and insect problems. So avoid overhead watering at all <laughs> possible and keep your garden clean, keep the weeds out, any plant debris, old plants or anything like that, go ahead and get those out of your garden. Even the weeds and stuff, even if you don't have disease and you want to compost it, uh, because you don't want to compost any diseased plants, you want to go ahead and trash those. Uh, but if, if you just are harvesting and it's the end of the season, you're get, taking your plants out and you want to go ahead and compost them and they've been healthy, go ahead and do it, but get them out of your garden. Don't leave them there. We told you some other diseases and, and even insects sometimes, they will overwinter and live in the soil in that plant debris and just wait for the new crop to come. So. Keep your garden clean. Start clean, stay clean. Uh, downy mildew is one that you'll see on a lot of the onions, uh, crops in the onion family. And that one you're gonna have these pale spots 
um, sometimes you'll even see the, the gray fuzzy growth of the fungus on the spot from the downy mildew. Uh, once again, remove the plant debris, um, have good air circulation, that helps to keep the weeds dry so the disease didn't you know, develop as much. And with all of these, a lot of times we will list a fungicide you can use, but as we try to emphasize, the fungicide should be your last choice of control. Do the sanitation and cultural methods first, and then if you have to, we do uh, say there are some fung fungi that are controlled by fungicides, so if you have a fungicide and you really need it, go ahead and use it, but um, try to make that your last choice. Um, good IPM, good uh, integrated pest management practices. Purple blotch is another one, uh, and it actually, you can see uh, the color of the, the lesions will turn kind of purple. So therefore, it's not a main purple blotch. It's an alternate area, so you will have those uh, zonate or central, you know, concentric circles develop on the, the leaves from purple blotch. But that purple color is a good giveaway for this particular disease. And of course, here we go again. This one's called white rot, but it's Sclerotinia. As you can see, this one, the the name is Sclerotinia sapiverum, and sepia is the part of the scientific name for uh, onions. And so this particular sclerotinia um, does, likes to live on plants in the allium family, but it's a sclerotinia. And you can see this particular sclerotinia, when it makes those sclerotia or survival um, units that the sclerotia, the sclerotinia make these sclerotia, it can live for 20 years in the soil. So if you get this in your uh, area where you're growing your alliums, you're going to have to do something uh, besides just try to get rid of the diseased plant. If it makes those sclerotia, it's going to be there a long time. So try to keep it clean. You know, if you have diseased plants, get rid of them as fast as possible so that they don't have a chance to form those survival units. Um, and if you have a raised bed, which is another good thing about doing growing vegetables in raised beds, you can always do a whole cell soil exchange, get rid of the old soil and put new soil in. Wow, that's the nuclear option, right? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> the final option. <laughs> All right, now we're going to the Apiaceae family. Formerly, again, here we go the, with the formerly, the, formerly the Umbelliferae. Family, <laughs> umbellifer umbelliferae. Yeah. So um, the characteristics are the uh, leaves. They're going to be alternate leaves with sheathing base, uh, sheathing bases. So they have an actual wraparound uh, at the bottom. Um, is that what I'm hearing? Yes. <laughs> the uh, inner nodes are usually hollow, and the plants are very aromatic. Mm -hmm. The flowers are small, inconspicuous. Uh, with parts that are in, in five, multiples of fives. And the flowers are in an umbel, uh, a number of short flower stalks which uh, spread out from a common point like an umbrella ribs. So you can see in the photo, again, hit the top, uh, it definitely looks like a little parasol type situation. So that would give you that umbrelliaceae name. Um, now we go to some of the plants that in, in, their, in this family are, the, are carrots, celery, parsley, dill, parsnip, fennel, and cilantro. So a lot of these are, are our herbs and our cooking uh, vegetables, and that's uh, that that's all a part part of that uh, aromatic nature of them that they are really add to our palate and our enjoyability of our food. But most of these are, are cool season, so they are a fall and winter plant. They, again, of course, like the full sun, well-drained, sandy soil with a pH of 5.5 to 7. So it's a pretty broad range. It nice and low, very acidic, all the way up to very neutral. Um, the germination is, uh, happens in soil that's between 61 and 74 degrees. And planting, you want to plant carrots and parsnips as a seed. Um, it's very important that you plant, uh, especially carrots, as a seed because as they send out that tap root, they will sense the bottom depth of the soil that they're in and stop growing, and then they will start 
They will stop growing downward, but then they'll start growing outward. So if you put them in a little four inch cell, you're never gonna get any carrots that are any longer than four inches. So, and they don't really like being transplanted anyway, but uh, when you're planting carrots, you want as deep a soil base as you can to have long, um, straight carrots. The uh, celery and fennel, cilantro, parsley, and dill, they can be done as seeds or transplants. Uh, of course, with the uh, soil test is the best way to get our soil uh, recommendations for, for nutrients. Uh, but generally, we don't fertilize them until after the uh, seeds have germinated, and then we put about two pounds of AAA fertilizer per 100 square feet about three to four weeks after planting. Give, those, uh, give themselves a little bit of chance to develop and not risk burning those uh, tender roots with that uh, harsh fertilizer. Some of the, uh, the, sp the spacing, again, depending on variety, uh, but in general, carrots only need about two to three inches of space between them. Now, it's kind of difficult to plant in individual little carrot seeds, so if you do have a situation where the, the carrots are too close, it's important to go back through and thin those carrots to the proper spacing. Uh, you know, don't be afraid, just go ahead and pinch them off the top. Try not to pull them out, because actually pulling them out, uh, you could damage the roots of the, the ones that are intermingled next to it. But you wanna have those, that right spacing, or you're gonna get some funny-shaped carrots. Um, they do, uh, harvest is about uh, 60 to 75 days. Celery, it uh, needs spacing about six to eight inches with 80 days to harvest. Cilantro, two to four inches with 50 to 55 days. Dill, two to four inches with 40 to 115 days. Now that's quite a span there. What's uh, What causes that big span? Yeah. Well, the 40 days is if you're gonna use the leaves and, the, and, the, and that part of the plant. Mm -hmm. About 40 days, you'll have plenty to use it. If you wanna use a seed head, mm -hmm. it's gonna take about 115 days Okay, good point, good point. Fennel, it needs about four to six inches with uh, 50 to 60 days to harvest. Parsley, eight to 12 inches, 75 days to harvest. And finally, parsnips, two to three inches and a good long days to harvest of 110 to 120 days. So think about all these uh, days to harvest as you're planting your garden. Uh, you know, if you're trying to think of something to plant later in the season, you definitely don't want to plant these uh, long-term vegetables and things like that. You want to plant them early in the season, and if you've still got space uh, in the garden later, you can, you can add some of these uh, plants with the quicker turnarounds. And finally, it's best to harvest uh, carrots. You can kind of, you can harvest them anytime when they reach the desired size. So the neat thing about carrots is as they grow, you can, you can kind of see the top and you can keep, uh, keep an eye on that. Now you have no idea what's going on, uh, on underground, so it's, it's, you know, be prepared to be surprised, uh, but you can pick them very small or you can go until they're very large. They're all gonna have that same flavor and they're gonna be the, the same palatability. Celery, you actually pick that when the stalks are, are, are an edible size, usually about three to five uh, inches in diameter for the whole bundle. Cilantro, when the plant has enough leaves to harvest. So we're gonna go ahead and go out there. This is one of those cool ones. You just pick as you go, get a few leaves here and there for your dinner. Dill, um, you're gonna, if you're doing the leaves, you can plant, you can, um, you can harvest those as soon as there's enough. You don't ever wanna rob all the leaves on one of these plants that you're trying to uh, maintain, but you can usually take about a third at a single time without uh, any kind of uh, bad effects. If you uh, looking for the seeds, uh, the seed heads, actually you want to, once the seeds are set, but while they're still green and tender. So if we're just using the heads, uh, we don't want that, uh, we don't want them tough. And if we're going for the seeds, we wanna wait uh, after the seed head is dry and the seeds drop easily. So if we're uh, trying to collect those, then we're actually waiting for them to actively come out of the, uh, out of the pods. And then with fennel, with leaves, you can plant uh, when, as soon as the plant has enough leaves again, you can start harvesting. Parsley, again, as soon as you have enough leaves. And parsnips, with the reach, uh, when the roots reach the full size. So we keep an eye on those. Again, you'll be able to see the tops uh, and see the progress of that. 
All right, I think Anna is going to talk about pests now. Yep, some common pests of our carrots and parsley and all these different herbs um, would include our aphids. We've talked a lot about these before, um, but they will cause some necrotic or some dead spots on the leaves on the foliage. Um, I see them a lot on parsley, actually. And that can also create a secondary problem with sooty mold as they're excreting that honeydew onto the plants. And that sooty mold kind of grows on the leaf surface or on the stems. Um, you can control them with natural predators. We've mentioned the beneficial wasps. Um, so if those aphids are brown and have a hole in the back of them, they're dead already. You don't need to control them. Um, reflective mulch can actually help with a lot of these crops. They make, um, it's like a roll of mulch that's like a mirror material almost or, or shiny material and that keeps them at bay. Um, you can use malathion. There's actually a carrot weevil that will feed on the roots of many of these crops, not just carrots, um, and it causes these sort of irregular zigzags on the roots. Um, I've seen this a number of times where you can still eat that carrot, you can cut those pieces off, but it is really unattractive and it makes them very hard to clean or scrub the dirt out of those surfaces. Um, the adults overwinter in crop debris, so again, keeping a very clean garden and a clean environment is going to help you there. Um, remove that crop debris and then rotate your crops if you have these as an issue. It's always a good idea anyway in a garden to rotate the different families that we're talking about through different areas of your garden as much as possible. And that gets tricky if you're container gardening or you have raised beds or a small space, but try to do it as much as you possibly can. Yeah. Um, nematodes love to feed on a lot of these crops. Now, think about where nematodes live. Many of them are in the soil, and that's where many of these crops are growing, so they like to get in there. And root knot nematode is a huge problem. Um, it makes them look kind of like Mardi Gras beads. There's little gnarled um, little lesions that they're living in there. Stubby root is another one. Needle nematodes. Um, if you get a lot of forking or distorted roots, especially in your carrots and parsnips, that can be a really good indicator that you might have a nematode issue. And with that, you do want to control them with soil solarization, which we talked about in the garden planning module, where you cover the garden area with plastic and seal the edges after you water the soil. The sun kind of cooks everything under there. Yeah. And those nematodes are usually in the top like three inches of soil anyway, so if it gets good and hot enough under there, especially in August or July, even into September in New Orleans, you can actually kill a lot of nematodes doing that. So it's a good technique for controlling them organically. And some of the common diseases that we're gonna have now, once again, you're gonna see a lot of these same fungi, at least the genera popping up. Like, oh yeah, I've seen that genus before but it might have a different name for the disease, uh, you know, like black rot. There's an alternate area causing problems. Uh, you can call it damping off, which we mentioned in the module on legumes, so you know what damping off is. Uh, it can cause uh, necrosis on the roots, as you can see on the carrots there on the top uh, picture. Uh, that's black rot. That's an alternate area causing that problem. And it can infect the, the leaves, but you usually will see the problem uh, most often on the roots. And the best way to control it is using resistant varieties, crop rotation, or certified disease-free seed, we call this at home. You want to start clean, stay clean. So black rot's one that you'll see on the carrot. Um, cottony rot, now that one is one that's no fun if you ever see it. Because not only do you have that, uh, you can see there on that picture, that ugly, fuzzy looking carrot, but it's, it's, they don't smell very, very good either. <laughs> so um, cottony rot, What's the name of the fungus? Sclerokinia. There's sclerokinia popping up again, which means if you've got that one, it's going to be able to live in the soil for very, very many years because it's going to make those survival units, the sclerotia. So sclerokinia, that one, the best way is to keep it out. So good sanitation practices are always a good idea. Uh, and as you've seen sclerokinia popping up over and over and over again, now you can get an idea why. Sanitation is a real important issue in controlling diseases. And then, of course, there's the bacterial diseases. Um, trying to keep them out is the best way to control them. Um, they don't survive very well in the soil. Most bacteria don't. Um, so um, they like moisture, so avoid overwatering, so you want to well drain the soil, you want good sanitation, uh, keep them out uh, so they don't become a problem. But they usually, with bacteria, you'll either they're always 
seems to be some soft tissue breakdown when you're dealing with bacterial diseases. Fungi, the, the tissue can stay very you know, tough, like nephrotic lesions and everything. It doesn't really get soft and, and mushy, but with bacterial rots, especially if they're going to name it bacterial soft rot, and this is caused <laughs> by several different fungi, the tulip berberini and the Mancinianus. And if you see that on your carrots, um, a lot of times it is post-harvest disease, um, but you just don't want to keep it out because you're less likely to get it. Okay, now we have, are into the Asparagiaceae. As <laughs> I'm going to get it no, one more time. Asparagiaceae. As oh, no, I'll get it. I'm, uh, Asparagiaceae. I got ah, it. Very good. <laughs> yes, I'm definitely going to learn my Latin here. But Asparagiaceae. <laughs> so we already talked about the Latin names and why they're important. And so we're going to try to stick with them. You know? But uh, they're not always easy. <laughs> so some of the characteristics of the Asparagiaceae. Asparagaceae family, are they, um, they're morphologically diverse. It's one, one species that we eat is uh, Asparagus officinalis, and it's a tall plant with stout stems and feathery foliage. So it's a very interesting little plant there. The flowers are bell-shaped and occur alone or in pairs. They're green, white, uh, to yellow in color. After flowering, a round berry is formed with one to six black seeds. Asparagus can live for 20 or more years. To grow asparagus, it is a perennial. Uh, it needs full sun. It needs well-drained, deep, sandy, or clay loam soil. So again, everything needs to be uh, pretty well-drained. Those roots need to stay uh, aerated and, and basically they'll drown just like we can drown in too much water. So the pH is between 6.0 and 7.5, uh, most often planted as uh, one to two year old crowns. So this is actually, you know, a pretty mature plant before you even uh, get it in the ground. At planting, you do a 10 inch furrow and the crown is placed with, um, they're 12 to 24 inches apart. The soil test is best again for the recommendations on fertility, but generally it's about a quarter of a pound of 10, 20, 10 per 60 square feet prior to planting. And then annually you want to put about two pounds in the late winter, uh, then uh, for the same area, is that right, Dr. Mm -hmm. Joe? Yeah. Uh, two pounds per 60 square feet in late winter, then one to two pounds of 21, zero, zero after the last harvest. So you're giving it that real good nitrogen boost after you've done your harvest so that the, uh, the remaining plant uh, has that boost to recover and come back. Then you, uh, so you don't harvest for two years after you're planting. So it takes two years before you're actually gonna have your first uh, harvestable crop. Most, re uh, most varieties do require a dormant period. So you, uh, even after you, uh, after you uh, to pick them, there's going to be another year before they even start uh, really producing again. And then harvest tender shoots when they're about four to ten inches long for about eight weeks by cutting spears one to two inches below the ground level. So you actually kind of pull the soil aside, get down in there, and you know, use your knife or your, your shears to cut below the side, ground level. Just a quick note, here in New Orleans, we don't get enough of a dormant period to really pull it off, though we have seen some people do it. So don't be afraid to experiment, but also don't be too disappointed if they struggle and they don't live for 20 years. <laughs> so it's, it's a fun experiment. Um, some common pests are the asparagus beetle. That's a really nice looking beetle. The spotted asparagus beetle. Um, they both can be controlled kind of just by removing the asparagus berries. They tend to feed on the berries, those red berries that are being produced. You can use spinosad or carbaryl as well. Um, I have not seen too much of this down in our area, but they can be an issue in other parts of the country. And some of our common diseases with the asparagus, um, it's asparagus rust. Once again, it's a rust. Therefore, what are you going to have? In most cases, you're going to have those orange pustules form, which are the spores being produced by the rust fungus, so you'll see that showing up on, on the spears and even on the, on the, 
the ferns, which is what they call the leaves. Um, and you can actually, if you get enough frost, it will start to die back. So manage your irrigation, but make sure you plant on you know, underwatered or overwatered, because that kind of plant stress will make them more susceptible to a lot of diseases, in this case specifically the asparagus stress disease. And you can use uh, sulfur as a way of controlling it. Um, but if you have rust on any of the, the plants, you want to go ahead and cut those, get rid of them as soon as possible to prevent the spread of the spore. Uh, here we go again with Cercospora. Mm -hmm. Cercospora variety of asparagus. This one, uh, as you can see with a lot of the different diseases like Alternaria, Cercospora, even the Sclerotinia, uh, you'll look at the species name, you know, think, oh, that reminds you of what plant this would infect, because some of these uh, are very specific to the plant they'll infect. So even though a Cercospora blight, the symptoms are very similar across all the different plants as far as the necrotic lesions that they cause, and usually kind of uh, brown or red color lesions. A lot of times they'll have the zonic um, attribute to them, but in this case it's a Cercospora. Asparagine, and so that lets you know, okay, this one's one that is specific to the asparagaceae, and in our case, this asparagus. And once again, no overhead watering, uh, get rid of the plant debris as soon as possible, start clean, stay clean. There are some fungicides you can use, but once again, last choice. And then Phytophthora we see often uh, as a root disease in a lot of our different plants. Um, they usually cause the soft watery rot of the, of the plant. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's right at the soil level and you'll see brown lesions. Uh, if you look inside the actual stem of the plant or even split the root open, you'll have that discoloration that, that we talked about, the brown discoloration. Mm -hmm. um, that's always a sign of disease in the, in the plant. So give that your kitchen roots like that. And with the Phytophthora diseases, they love water. Yep. So having your plants growing in a very well-drained area a good way to keep uh, phytophthora diseases from developing. And again, avoid that overhead watering. Just never <laughs> say that. All right. Now we move into the Asteraceae family, formerly known as the Compositae family. But the characteristics are the flowers um, has a head, is, um, is a composite of many individual flowers, usually both ray and disc florets. So, as you'll, the sunflower is the common example of those, and you've noticed they are formed like a giant saucer. The fruit is a seam, which is a small, dry, one seeded fruit that does not open to release the seed. It includes uh, lettuce, endive, and artichoke. Um, growing the lettuces, they are a cool season crop. They do germinate between 59 and 69 degrees Fahrenheit. They like to Again, the well-drained, rich in organic matter soil between 6 and 7 pH. Full sun. They can be planted directly as seeds or as transplants. You do want to soil test for fertilizer recommendations or use 2 pounds of 5, 10, 15 per 100 square feet monthly. Growing artichokes, it's a perennial herbaceous thistle. Mm -hmm. It likes deep, well-drained soil, and it, the range here is pretty hot, pretty big, between 6 and 8 pH. The optimal daytime temperature is between 21 to, um, excuse me, 20 to 22 degrees Celsius, which is 68 to 71 degrees Fahrenheit, and the optimal nighttime temperature is 12 to 14 Celsius, or 53 to 53.6 uh, to 53. 7.2 Fahrenheit, so they do like that, that cool night uh, temperature. Um, the temperature extremes do reduce the tenderness of that, uh, that flower that we're trying to eat. Planting, usually as a transplants or vegetatively from the underground shoots. And again, soil test, soil test, soil test, <laughs> but generally one quarter of 888 per plant per month. The spacing on these would be two to three inches for artichokes. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, that's a big plant. Sorry, my bad. Yes, two to three feet. It's a very large plant um, with 75 to 85 days to harvest from the transplant. 
Lettuces, on the other hand, six to 12 inches with uh, 28 to 58 days to harvest. Lettuces are one of those nice things, especially the, the loose leaf lettuces, is that we can pick as the plant is maturing. So we can actually pick the older leaves as it's growing, leaving the younger ones to continue. And so we can have daily salad rather than waiting and picking the whole thing at once. Um, and then Belgian endive, it's very small spacing, uh, two to four inches. And the days of har to harvest is 21 to 28 days after portion. And then best to harvest um, artichokes uh, when the flower bud is young and tight, but before it starts to open. It's a, sort of like that broccoli and cauliflower. You want it nice and tight and firm, mm -hmm. but once it starts opening, it, you've waited too long. The lettuce, again, is a leaf as soon as the leaves are the desired size. Um, but you can take the, the whole head, the loose varieties or the head lettuce, as soon as it's reached the desired size you'd like. And with endive, the new buds um, are, are harvested at two to four inches after forcing. Okay, a couple of common pests here. Aphids, as you've already seen, they love the Asteraceae's, um, particularly the, the tender stuff like the lettuce and the endive. Um, lots of problems. They get down inside the heads. They like to breed and feed down in there. Um, insecticidal soap is a really good control option when we get into some of these crops. Uh, the Lepidopteran caterpillars kind of have a field day with lettuce especially. <laughs> um, as we've already seen, use Bt to control them. And then snails and slugs. This is a huge issue in moist, wet climates like New Orleans. Um, they make these irregularly shaped holes in all the leaves. You don't see them in the daytime. They feed at night. So people are often confused as to why there's damage. But they leave slime trails. So that's a good giveaway. Um, and then they can actually leave their poop behind, too. That goes for caterpillars, too. Remember, that's called frass. Um, that's the word of the day. And you can control snails and slugs with an iron-based bait product, um, an iron phosphate, basically, that they'll pick up and eat. And that actually does kill them. So it's a huge problem in these crops with those guys. And some of the common diseases. Uh, you're going to start to recognize some of these. Look at that first, the metastrop, sclerotinia. <laughs> there are actually two uh, species of sclerotinia that, are, that have been associated with what's called metastrop. The metastrop essentially, the outer leaves just go, <laughs> it's dropping its leaves. And that's usually the sclerotinia. They've got sclerotinia minor and sclerotinia sclerotiol. Look at that. Once it makes those, those survival uh, nodules, uh, make little things that it makes, the sclerotia, it can survive in the soil for eight to 10 years. So sclerotinia, once you get that kind of disease in your soil, it's, it's, very it's tough. I mean, you have to be very selective about what you grow and, and the way you treat it. So once again, start clean and stay clean. Keep it out as much as possible. Uh, you'll see that with the letters drop, like I said, the outside leaves will drop. Uh, it spreads by, uh, from plant to plant sometimes by Splattering, so avoid overhead irrigation again. I'm going to say that almost every time. Avoid overhead irrigation and sanitation. As soon as you see a disease plant start to develop, go ahead and get rid of it, even if it's the only one you've got. Yep. Get rid of it because you may want to grow that same type of vegetable again next year in that same spot. And if you let the disease develop and make these survival uh, organs that it leaves in the soil, then um, you can't grow that same stuff again for several years. Remember that. Uh, bottom rot, this is one caused by Rhizactonia. You've seen Rhizactonia cause it's damping off as a middle crop. And with uh, lettuces and Asteraceae family plants, a lot of times it causes um, what is termed bottom rot. And this one, I'm sure everyone's seen this one whenever you, especially in head lettuce, whenever you start to peel the leaves away or cut it open and you got this brown, uh, slimy, reddish brown, slimy stuff on the inside of the leaves. This looks like they're melting away. Uh, you just want to throw the whole thing away right away. A lot of times that's the rhizoctonia causing that. And so uh, the best way to avoid rhizoctonia in the garden is avoid excessive watering and using mulching. Mulching is really good, a really good way to keep the Rosectonia from splashing up 
on to the upper parts of the plant. So I'm trying to keep the plant protected by using the mortars. And of course, there's the viruses. Uh, lettuce mosaic virus is one of the most common ones that we see with lettuce. And that one, the, the, you'll actually see um, the leaves will start to you know, get that mosaic pattern again. They'll become deformed. Um, and uh, it can really stunt the plant. Uh, it's an aphid vector. But the best way to avoid lettuce mosaic virus is to use resistant varieties. It's, it's, what is a problem is when you have the resistant varieties, they are available. Uh, and um, use certified disease free seed. Mm -hmm. Again, viruses, a lot of times our seed comes from those. <laughs> All right, the Kinopodiaceae family includes the beets, spinach, and chard. It has simple leaves. The flowers are minute and inconspicuous, greenish in color. The calyx usually consists of between one to five sepals, usually five. There are no petals. There are two, rarely three to five, styles or signals. So it's a very simple little flower. The fruit is, again, a seam. The, um, for growing beets, spinach and chard, it's a cool season. So uh, planted fall, uh, winter, and early spring. It's, again, full sun. They do like well-drained soil, high in organic matter, which with a pH between 6.3 and 6.8. So it's a, a fairly small range there in, in the acidic side. The germination, it likes to germinate the seeds in 59 to 69 degrees Fahrenheit. They are direct seeded, uh, charred spinach, uh, direct seeded, but charred in spinach can be transplants. Again, soil test for the fertilization um, recommendations, but generally it requires about two to two and a half pounds of 888 fertilizer per 100 square feet prior to planting, and again, when the plants are four to six inches tall. Some, again, the spacing can be uh, varietal dependent. For beets, it's only about two to four inches apart with a harvest of 55 to 60 days. Chard has six to eight inch spacing with 25 to 55 days. And spinach, three to six inches with 35 to 45. And again, the chard and the spinach is one of those that can be picked continuously as it grows. And the best to harvest uh, beets. You want to harvest the young beets when the roots are about one to two inches in diameter or mature beets when the roots are size about three to five inches in diameter. Again, this is kind of like carrots. As they mature, you can see the top of the bulb growing and you can keep an eye on it. The, the worst thing to do is let these things get too big. Uh, they lose their flavor, they start splitting, all kinds of things happen. Chard, as soon as the leaves reach the desired size, uh, but are still tender, again, you want to pay attention to that. And for spinach, the leaves or whole plants when dark green, young and tender. Okay, some common pests, and we'll blast right through these. Aphids and flea beetles, you know, weak miners, we've seen all these before. Army worms, you know, cabbage loopers, uh, root knot nematodes, and then we're adding a new one here, the beet cyst nematode. Mm. Um, if you see seedlings in your beet crops that are somewhat stunted um, with reduced leaf growth or a lot of maybe sort of gnarly looking roots once you get into harvesting, and lack of secondary roots and yellow brown cysts on them, that can be an indication of a nematode problem. So that beet cyst nematode might be there. And they are our first, our, there are resistant varieties for this particular pest. So that's something you can look for in a seed catalog. Again, sanitation, we're gonna really push that. And then sol soil, soil solarization, as we've mentioned before, really good way to control some of those um, soil living organisms. Uh, in our home gardens. And now, some of the common diseases, you're going to see these names popping up again. So keep that in mind that usually with these different diseases, uh, the common organism, or sometimes even the names are common, like we have here, and Bragnose, and downy mildew, and Cercospora leaf spot. Yep. Uh, you have the similar organisms causing the disease. You're going to have similar symptoms, whether it's on the Kinopodiaceae, on the Solanaceae, or on the Apiaceae. Mm -hmm. and uh, usually the control mechanisms are going to be the same. 
So keep that in mind that uh, a lot of these diseases uh, might be a different species of fungus, but, but the genus, genus is normally uh, the same with, say, the anthracnose, and so the symptoms are gonna be the same with the anthracnose. You're gonna have those, those lesions um, that have that um, brown, thin, papery lesion. Mm -hmm. A lot of times there'll be a, a halo around um, with the anthracnose, even with the Schatoska leaf spot. Similar symptoms uh, with those necrotic lesions and the halo. Um, once again, a lot of these will survive on plant debris. Mm -hmm. Good sanitation. Get that plant debris out as soon as possible. Don't leave it laying around. Don't think that allowing the leaves and all these parts of your plant to fall and then naturally compost and decompose will add nutrients back to the soil. It's true, they would if they were healthy. But if they have just a little bit of the disease on them, you leave them there, they are food for those microorganisms, those fungi, those bacteria, those other things that are gonna uh, give you problems later on. So with your crops, it's usually a good idea to get those, that plant debris out as soon as possible. If you want to add organic matter, add it as fully composted material and, and using mulching, but don't leave the, the plant debris there. That's with all of these diseases. With the uh, anthracnose, the downy mildew, Schatoska leaf spot, even the bacterial bites, they can survive in that plant debris. Mm -hmm. And again, avoid overhead watering. Overhead watering is just going to spread the disease. So make sure you avoid the overhead watering. Um, with bacterial diseases and, and especially uh, and viral diseases, make sure you get a certified disease-free seed. Uh, with uh, the, the virus diseases that we're listing here, there's quite a few you can see that will infect the chemoproteaceae uh, and they are all insect transmitted, either aphids or leaf hoppers or thrips, um, they will vector them. Uh, and with some of them, controlling the vector would be a way of controlling the virus spread, but unless you really look into it, you know exactly which virus you're dealing with and whether it requires a long incubation period in the insect before it can be transmitted, unless you go into that much detail, Usually just assume that controlling the vector is not going to give you good control of the virus spread. So use resistant varieties. Keep the weeds out. Mm -hmm. Alternate hosts, you don't want those around, and that's what weeds serve as a lot of times. All right, the Maldaceae family. The, the characteristics are the vegetative parts. Let's see, hold on. <laughs> Mucilage, <laughs> slimy, slimy protein. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now we have the Malvaceae family. Some of the characteristics are that the vegetative parts have um, mucilage, which is a slimy protein that you may encounter. The leaves all often are palmately veined mm -hmm. and lobed with star-shaped hairs. The flowers have five petals and sepals. Uh, five to many stamens, often fused. The fruit is usually a capsule, a simple dry fruit uh, that splits at maturity with locules or chambers, and that includes okra and hibiscus. So to grow okra, it's a warm season crop. It's uh, one of the very few things that we can still grow in the summertime that do really well. Uh, it's, um, okra is a heat lover, full sun. So it likes well-drained, sandy loam soil, high in organic matter, with a pH of between 5.8 and 6.8. Germination takes place in soil that's 75 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's, that's way up there for any of these other plants that we've seen. Pre-soaking uh, seed does improve the results. You wanna place the um, plants 12 to 8, 18 inches apart. You know, again, paying attention to the variety, that's gonna give you uh, some of that um, change there. You can harvest beginning at 50 to 60 days, but uh, it will continue to produce through the season. Harvest young tender pods that are about three to six inches long. This is important to, to scout your, um, your, your, your okra every day because really these things will mature overnight and then the next day they'll be too big. They become fibrous and tough as they mature. Um, Again, 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 soil test for re recommendations, but the general recommendation is one pound of triple eight fertilizer 
for 100 square feet after the first pod is set and every three to three, no, excuse me, three to four weeks after that. Some common pests that we find on our mallows would be our aphids and our thrips, which can vector viruses, which Dr. Joe will mention in the next slide. Um, the two-spotted spider mite really likes these crops as well. Um, white flies, which also vector viruses, and then fire ants. This is a huge problem here in New Orleans where the fire ants will eat the base of the developing blooms, and then you don't get an okra pod or a hibiscus pod that sets correctly. Or they can be um, completely misshapen or they'll fall off if they do form. They're not able to kind of grow to a mature size where you'd want to use and harvest them. Um, and you can control fire ants in your garden with insecticides outside of the growing area. There aren't any products really for use in a vegetable garden, but there are some really good granular bait products that you can put sort of in the general area that they'll go out and find, and then they'll bring back into their mound, and then you can control them that way. And uh, some of our common diseases, the nice thing about okra, which is the most common in the Malvaceae family, is mm -hmm. it's one of those crops that, as Chris mentioned, Loves the sun, mm -hmm. so you can grow it out in the heat. It's not going to wilt on you. Uh, as you saw with the flower, it's a beautiful flower. Some people can grow it just as an ornamental. Yes. Uh, there are red varieties, green varieties, white varieties. So you got a color palette there to choose from. Mm -hmm. So a nice, really you know, nice look to it. And they don't really have many disease or insect problems. It is a really tough plant. Mm -hmm. It can take a lot and still give you the beauty of the flowers and the wonderful uh, pods that we eat. Mm -hmm. And of course, can't make gumbo without <laughs> okra. One of the common names for okra is gumbo. But a few of the diseases, there again, we got the southern virus, the sterakinia. Um, can cause some problems. Uh, white mold, sterakinia, uh, root knot nematode can be a problem on okra but um, it's not as common as on some other crops. And if you get root, remember getting nematodes, there are no products labeled for use to kill nematodes, especially by own virus. Mm -hmm. So if you have nematode problems, really look into soil solarization. That is one of your best means of controlling nematodes in your garden. Uh, powdery mildew, you're gonna have that development of the, the fungus, um, the powdery covering on the leaves, Want to get rid of the plant debris as much as soon as possible. Have good air circulation amongst your plants. That's always a good idea. And with most of the plants to keep down the fungal diseases, especially the leaf diseases, they like moisture on the leaf to develop and to infect. So if you keep the leaves dry, you can avoid a lot of those uh, leaf problems on all your crops. And in this case, we're talking about the malvaceae, the okra, the hibiscus. Um, plant them so that you have that good air circulation. Um, don't have anything blocking it. Can use neem, which is a good product for a lot of the, of the leaf diseases. Uh, it's a natural product uh, and it does a good job. We have some other uh, fungicides listed, and again, get rid of the plant debris. When you see powdery mildew or any leaf disease that's developing on your plants, one thing to remember is once that leaf has a disease, it can never be cured. So that leaf is no good to the plant anymore. Because the disease, those lesions are going to spread. If it's powdery mildew, it's just going to kill the leaf. The leaf is not going to be photosynthesizing. And by leaving it on the plant, you're giving the fungus time to develop spores, which are going to spread to other parts of the plant. So remember, leaf diseases, once the leaf has them, you can't cure them. It's never going to go back to being a green leaf again. So get rid of it. Cut it off. Get it out of the garden, and you're going to save yourself some problems. And of course, as Ann mentioned, the um, virus diseases, there is one that I see on okra, um, the yellow vein mosaic virus, and it actually, the leaves turn kind of yellow, as we see in the example there compared to the green leaves. And it, they'll turn, the whole leaf will kind of turn yellow, and sometimes the veins will turn either turn dark green or they will become clear. Mm -hmm. So you'll have the clear looking veins in the leaf with the lighter green parotid tissue in between. And resistant varieties and getting rid of the plant debris is the best way to control these. One note about the uh, neem oil, Dr. Joe, is uh, make sure you read the label and follow those heat recommendations. Yes. Uh, uh, we're growing okra in the hottest time of the year, and I, I kind of crispy fried some 
once when I was growing it, splitting out the neem oil on a, on a warm day. Uh, so make sure you follow the label directions. All right, now we go into the Poaceae family. The char characteristics of these are they're monocots. The flower has one to many florets that are aggregated into spikelets. The fruit is caryopsis, which is a specialized type of dry, one-seeded fruit, which is characteristic of grasses, in which the ovary wall is united with the seed coat. This includes corn, rice, wheat, barley, oats, sugarcane, millet, and sorghum. Worldwide, 70% of all crops grown are corn, rice, and wheat, which provide more than 50% of all the calories consumed by humans. This is a very important family, you can imagine. And sweet corn is our primarily uh, of our concern for home gardens here. So for growing corn, it is a warm season crop. You do want well-drained soil, which is rich in organic matter, between 6 to 6.8. The germination is between 68 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, that can really germinate in some pretty warm soil. It is direct seeded, space the plants 10 to 12 inches apart, and they must be planted in blocks. This is very important. Um, corn is wind pollinated and it needs to be arranged in a situation where that the wind blowing through it can pick up the pollen, move around, pass through, and, and transfer that pollen from the male part of the flowers to the female part. Um, it doesn't have to be a very big, I've grown corn in a five by five plot and it turned out really well, but if you have it in a one foot wide, 10 foot long column, you probably won't get very much corn. So the days to harvest was between uh, 65 to 95 days. And that depends on, on what uh, state you want to pick it in, as well as the uh, variety. The soil test for fertilization, uh, of course, but then, but corn is a heavy feeder, especially nitrogen. So it generally needs about two to two and a half pounds of triple eight per 100 uh, square feet at one foot tall and again at three foot tall. You want to harvest the corn when the kernels are plump and milky, usually when the silt turns brown. Some of the common diseases that we see in the Poaceae family are again like anthracnose, cercospis, and rust, and downy mildew. You guys all have heard those before. I don't have to tell you what they look like, you know. And a couple of a different ones that we might see with um, in the Poaceae with the corn. One of them is charcoal rot. Uh, this is a fungus that you haven't seen yet, uh, Macrophamina, and that one. And infects the plant stalks and they become um, very shredded. They have the, as you can see in the picture here, um, up here that they you know, have that black discoloration in the stalk. And it kind of hollows it out and only leaving behind the, the fibrous uh, tissue is all that's being left behind. And there's no resistant varieties or no fungicides that are available to use um, for control of charcoal rot. Uh, so the best thing is to keep the plant healthy, don't stress it out and uh, having good fertilization and water management. Making sure you're providing the corn, as Chris mentioned, uh, it's a heavy feeder on nitrogen, um, and the plant will tell you when it, if it needs more a lot of times. And as we talked about in the plant nutrition module, where we showed you the different symptoms or the different appearance of, of lacks of different nutrients in the plants. Um, Corn is one that will show really rapidly. So if you start to see some of the nutrient deficiency, go ahead and add it. Um, that's, uh, that's what you want to do is provide the plant what it needs, keep it healthy. Uh, and one, um, when it comes to the corn smut, the main viruses, those are uh, a lot of viruses that will infect uh, corn. Uh, a lot of those are vectored viruses. Uh, as you can see, uh, all the way from the maize dwarf mosaic virus all the way down to wheat streak virus. A lot of viruses that affect the Poaceae family. Uh, the best way to control those is using um, disease-free seed, uh, getting rid of the weeds, and um, some, but in some you can control the vector to prevent spread, and others um, the vector will do much more to keep it. And then of course one which if you ever see it, you'll never forget it is corn smut, <laughs> Eustelagazae. That is one that uh, in 
affects the ears especially, and it makes this humorous looking growth <laughs> as the infected fruit <laughs> of, the, of the clam, you just enlarge it, it has this purplish color to it, and the thing about the smut, there are some resistant varieties, but those tumor looking galls that are on the plant tissue, uh, it affects the ears, it will affect the tassels, uh, that's where you see it mostly. And that fungus is edible. So when it's still nice and young and tender, it might look uh, like something from outer space, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you can actually eat that fungus. And uh, I think Anna's even had it. Yeah, it's eating good. It, and it says it's pretty good. <laughs> it's Some pretty people good. think that smut fungus is so good that they will naturally infect their corn just to get the fungus. They don't want the corn, they want that uh, smut fungus. You can it actually is a buy disease, it. But yeah. <laughs> you can buy it in a can, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's so. a delicacy. <laughs> Very much for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, some common pests that we get in our sweet corn, um, again, aphids, corn earworm, we talked about that um, in our insect module, army worms, flea beetles, thrips, which can vector those viruses that Dr. Mm -hmm. Joe had mentioned, and then spider mites as well. So you should have some good control options in your, the back of your mind for each of these. Um, I would say in our area, it's usually the army worms, um, or the corn earworm that folks have the most problems with. The earworm especially, because you think your, your ears are ready to pick, and then you go to check them, you pull the silk back, and it's all gross, because that, that caterpillar's been in there feeding and pooping, and it's heartbreaking. <laughs> um, but those are the two that we have the most issues with here in the Greater New Orleans area. And again, all this can come from your garden, with just a little bit of vigilance and some work and staying on top of things, not overhead watering, doing soil <laughs> testing, and keeping a nice sanitary garden. Um, we can really grow a huge diversity of foods right in our own backyards, in our front yards, in some flower pots. So give it a try. <laughs>